Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Alexander. I'm a faculty member here at the University of Utah in the Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to day one of Imaging Elevated. This is our department's annual symposium to showcase exciting research from around the country, uh, around the continent actually, um, with special focus on emerging investigators, by which we mean early career researchers in graduate school, postgraduate training, postdoctoral fellows, uh, and junior faculty members. Like most of you are probably used to by now, uh, we've had to convert to a virtual format this year in light of the pandemic. Uh, so things will be a little different, but we're still really excited about the format and the opportunities we have to give you some great presentations this year that have been assembled. Um, a logistical man uh, matter to start with just to cover, only the presenters today will have access to audio on this Zoom uh, session. So for the question and answer sessions, uh, first following Dr. Bloomkey's talk and then later after, our invited panelists, um, only the presenters will have uh, access to the audio. So it's important that if you would like to ask a question, please click that Q&A button uh, on the chat control panel and uh, we'll be collating all the questions and then uh, relaying them to the panelists uh, in due course. Um, so with that, uh, I again would like to say welcome and I would like to start by introducing Dr. Satoshi Minishima. He is the Ann G. Osborne Chair of Radiology and Imaging Sciences here at the University of Utah and our leader for this symposium. Uh, we appreciate his support for this. So Dr. Minishima. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, welcome uh, to the Imaging Elevated 2020. Um, my name is Satoshi Minishima. I'm the chair of the radiology department. Um, I'll just give you a brief history of Imaging Elevated. So we started this symposium four years ago and uh, as we all know, uh, um, imaging is such an exciting field of research and the clinical practice and education. So the goal of this symposium is really to highlight the value of imaging in all of those domains and also feature you know, upcoming stars in the field of imaging uh, together with senior experts you know, to re discuss recent progresses. And uh, this symposium is typically a three-day event and including uh, uh, imaging site visit. So we have a uh, relatively large amount of resources imaging as well as research uh, building, uh, imaging research building. And also we have uh, multiple dinners and uh, also excursion to Park City and the post symposium party and all those really fun events. But unfortunately, we cannot do that uh, due to uh, COVID-19 this year. So instead, uh, so organizing committee, uh, Matt and Donna, Sherry, Tasha, Amy, and Michael, uh, they really actually work hard to make this virtual meeting as exciting as uh, in-person meeting. So I'm really, really uh, grateful for that. And also we have uh, really outstanding speakers and the plenary speakers. So Dr. Brumke today <clears throat> and uh, Gano uh, uh, Ganoni tomorrow with uh, Dr. Payne and also Dr. Zaharchak uh, on Friday. And I just want to let you know, I think all of those speakers are very, very super busy. So I'm really grateful for their time to uh, participate in this symposium and uh, give a lecture to us. And also, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank our sponsors, so Siemens, uh, Samsung, and the Cardinal Health. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your support uh, in this very interesting uh, and the challenging uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, year. So hopefully, um, you'll enjoy this three-day virtual symposium and uh, uh, able to exchange you know, exciting ideas you're working on and I look forward to learning from this symposium. So thank you very much for attending uh, Imaging Elevated 2020. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Minishima. Uh, so let's get on with uh, the afternoon's activities. Uh, again, a reminder about the Q&A sessions, please use the Q&A box within Zoom. Uh, we don't want your questions to go missed. So uh, first, uh, order of events. I, it's my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. David Bloomkey, who is a professor of radiology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Also notably, he's the editor of the journal Radiology, which we are all familiar with and understand 
uh, know is the field's most prominent scholarly journal. Previously, he's been the director of radiology and a tenured investigator at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And he was professor of radiology and medicine at the John Ho Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Bloomkey received his PhD in biophysics in 1987 at the University of Chicago, and he also completed his MD at the same institution, followed by training in residency and fellowship in radiology at Johns Hopkins. His research focus on early detection and diagnosis of cardiovascular disease using non-invasive imaging techniques, particularly MRI and CT. He's well known as the principal investigator for MRI studies in the NHLBI funded multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, also known as MESA, as well as for creating diagnostic MR criteria for arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, also known as ARVC. Besides his focus on MRI, he's also established the NIH program for infectious disease imaging, the NIH photon counting CT facility, and cited the first hospital-based PET MR scanner in the United States. He has an H index of 130 and is the author of more than 770 peer-reviewed papers and has 30 books and chapters to his credit. We're honored to have Dr. Bloomkey join us today and to give us a keynote presentation and then later facilitate a question and answer session with today's junior presenters. This is David Blumke at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. As you heard in the introduction, I'm also the editor of the journal Radiology. I'm very honored to participate in this year's virtual Imaging Elevated Symposium. As you can see, the topic of this talk is about building your career. My title is Creativity and Coattails. I moved back to Madison about three years ago, and it is a little colder here than I remember. That slide is just a little bit of an exaggeration, but not as much as you might think. We do recover fully from the winter with a remarkable summers in Madison. I think you're also wonderfully lucky to be in the Utah area. I make it out to the Four Corners area once or twice a year with my family. A bit of the light in the shots. Back to my topic about building your career. When you finish your radiology training, you'll probably be in your early 30s. That is, if you don't take too many detours to get there. Depending on your goals, you have 30 or 40 years to go in your radiology career. Radiologists might interpret more than a half a million cases over that period of time. So my question, just how much of a rush are you into starting to read that half million cases? I'd like to make the point to consider some advantages of being in academics and ways to be successful, a career path that I see being taken by an increasing number of our residents at Madison. In academics, you have a range of possible opportunities in addition to reading all of those MRI and CT cases. At one time, the triple threat academic was the person who was an expert clinician, a great teacher, and who excelled at research. Now, there are also a lot of opportunities in administration, the increasing need for physicians to participate in medical center activities. But even with all of these options, publishing or creating new knowledge is an important part of your career. So why talk about publishing? As a physician, as you already know, you're constantly being measured. Multiple companies have put a lot of effort into measuring your publications as one indicator of your career progress. This can be taken to the extreme. This little animation on the right side is some version of me. I found this on a university website. I'm at the center and my collaborators are all of those dots around me. So why is publishing important? Let's take a lesson from history. Leonardo da Vinci was not only a great artist, he was also a medical scientist. He performed 30 autopsies and took meticulous notes about his findings. On the right-hand side is a page from his lab notebook. He was extremely interested in this bulge in the ascending aorta just above the aortic valve. Why is it there? What's the purpose? He created glass models of the aorta and watched particles of sand flow down the aorta. He came to the conclusion the purpose of the aortic sinus was to improve the function of the aortic valves. Although medical publishing was available in the 1500s, da Vinci was curious for curiosity's sake. He never published his observations. The pages from his notebook were found hundreds of years later. You might recall, recall this bulge in the aorta, the sinuses of Valsalva. 
Antonio Vassalva rediscovered the purpose of this aortic bulge and published his autopsy findings in 1740. Today, we're still interested in the aortic sinus. The 4D cardiac MRI on the right-hand side shows blood flow past the aortic valves. You can see small eddy currents that form behind the aortic valves at the aortic sinus. These small eddy currents keep the valve from hitting the aortic wall when the valve opens. This helps to prevent damage to the valve. Currently, we have many modern new ways of tracking news in the literature. One popular measure is the altmetric score. The altmetric score tends to represent the immediate newsworthiness of a scientific publication. It's the combination of factors such as tweets, news stories, and social media posts. This article about breast cancer published in radiology had a very high score of 739 in the top 5% of all altmetric scores. Writing and publication is a good way to document your productivity. In that story about da Vinci, his work on the aortic sinus was discovered more than 200 years later. His creativity and productivity in that area had been lost. For us, publication of key results is critical for grant applications, for promotions, and for career building. When starting your career, there is some advantage to the number of publications. But over the long run, it's the quality of those publications that counts more than quantity. I used to suggest to young staff they should publish about two first author articles per year early in their career. Documenting your activities is even more important in other parts of the world. In the Netherlands, for example, you're employed by the government and your publications are submitted to federal regulators. In Germany, medicine is also funded by the government. Your radiology department receives more funding if there is a greater quantity and quality of publications by the radiology faculty. But it's just not academics. In business, publications can also help elevate your profile and stature. A popular measure of the importance of a publication in a medical journal is the impact factor. We know a higher number is better, but let's review exactly what the impact factor means. The impact factor refers to other people who refer to your publication, citing your publication in the reference list. The impact factor refers to citations over the prior two years. For example, if the impact factor is one, that means that the scientific article or all of the articles in the medical journal are cited on average once per year. It's interesting, there is a big difference between the most widely read medical journals and the most cited journals. For example, the New England Journal of Medicine has an impact factor of 75, but it does not even appear in the top five most widely read medical journals. Similarly, the journal Radiology has an impact factor of about eight. Radiographics has an impact factor that's almost 50% less. Yet about 50% more people read the articles in radiographics since they represent great clinical reviews and teaching articles. One of the biggest problems about writing for most of us, we're simply not very good writers. We have very little training in that area. We're terrific readers, we can learn very quickly, but there are not too many physicians who are excellent writers. This can cause problems with publishing and advancing your career. Two factors to remember. Number one, you're definitely not the only one with this problem. One of the most famous radiologists in the field over the past 25 years had a big issue with writing, but that person figured out how to overcome their problem. Number two, get someone else to help to reread and correct the writing. Having evaluated more than 15,000 manuscripts over the last three years, I can assure you that everyone can benefit by an editor to help them. Certainly a big issue. You need something to write about. This starts with a good idea, but there are several challenges. In many cases, the challenge is money and time. To give you an idea, the NIH calculates that the average cost per research publication is about $100,000. That figure accounts for factors like the cost of time of researchers and also the cost of drugs, CT, or MRI scans. For those interested in a research career, as a radiologist, it's very likely that you spend all or most of your time doing patient activities. In many cases, we need to do our research on the side, part-time. In order to compete for research funding, radiologists need to compete with full-time researchers in the lab. For example, our PhD scientists can devote most of their time to their research projects, 
no patient care responsibilities. In radiology departments, many have allowed an academic day per week for the staff, but finances are getting tight. Some departments are focusing on a full-time clinical staff separate from the full-time research staff. In most cases, it helps to obtain research funding. There are several sources that can help get your projects off the ground. The RSNA is one of the best places to apply for an early career award. In some cases, the funding rate is up to 30% of those who apply. Also, most universities have small internal grants to help get the project started to support the local faculty. There are other ways. An excellent way to get started is to participate in multi-center trials. These are usually led by experienced researchers and clinicians. Someone else is doing the organizational work. By active participation in multi-center studies, you can learn from outstanding colleagues at other universities. Industry funding might also be a source of funding for your project. You definitely want to collaborate with other investigators at your own institution. But really, any source of funding is better than no funding at all. It gives you the ability to get independent time to think and to get organized. Early in my career, I even set up a teleradiology practice just to pay for key staff members in my research lab. One of the key requirements for success in an academic career is team research. It's impossible for you to have all of the knowledge by yourself. You'll need to assemble a small research team, a group of collaborators. A second factor that really helps identify a mentor, someone with more experience, and hopefully someone smarter than you with good advice. A good example of mentorship is shown here. This group of people is referred to as the PayPal Mafia. A picture is shown from 2007. This group began with the idea of PayPal on the internet. But from those early days, the group evolved to develop five billionaires from its midst, including Elon Musk. One of the keys for success was the ability to mentor each other in new business ventures. During my residency, our chair was Dr. Bill Brody who later became the president of Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Brody was a radiologist. He had previously been in cardiac surgery and he had started his own company to make MRI scanners. He led small discussions with residents and talked about mentorship. His idea was that many people are successful because they work with other successful people on their coattails. The concept is the junior person in the field who rides on the coattails of the senior mentor. The senior mentor understands the unwritten rules, the processes and procedures for success. At this point, I hope I convinced you very few people succeed alone. We all need to get advice from our mentors. But looking at it in another way, why does someone want to mentor you? One answer that comes up frequently, not only are you smart, but you work hard. In order to succeed on the coattails of others, that person needs to want to work with you. We all have senior staff members in our departments, but our attending physicians are there to supervise and teach you. Supervision is very different than mentorship. One of the factors that's always impressed me about my junior colleagues, they're willing to work so hard to put in that extra effort that's required. Well, here's a short story about working hard. This is from a biography of a well-known individual and is taken from that person's biography. The title of the story, The Day Has 24 Hours. I'll let you know the name of the person at the end. The famous person had just given a public policy lecture. At the end, a student raised his hand. I'm at a state institution and my tuition has gone up twice since I've entered college. It's too high. I need more financial aid from the state. Speaker, what do you mean too high? Student, well, now I have to work part-time. Speaker, what's wrong with that? Student, I have to study. Speaker, let's figure this out. How many hours do you go to class? Student, alternating, two classes one day, three classes the next day. Speaker, and how much studying do you have to do? Student, each day, six hours. Speaker, okay, eight hours one day, nine hours the other day what you do with the rest of your time. Student, what do you mean? Speaker, well, the day has 24 hours. Have you thought about working more, taking more classes rather than wasting your life away? Student, I'm not wasting my life away. Speaker, yes, you are. You have 16 hours left. 
Use three of those hours to study more and take more classes. Plus, you need maybe six hours for sleep. If your part-time job takes four hours, you still have time for dating and dancing and drinking and going out. Why are you complaining? The day is 24 hours. Who is the speaker? The name of the speaker, Arnold Schwarzenegger. You think of Schwarzenegger as Arnold in The Terminator, a bodybuilder and actor, but that underplays his accomplishments in a variety of fields. Arnold Schwarzenegger was raised in a very modest family in Austria. He became the number one bodybuilder in the world. He became the highest paid movie actor in the United States, despite difficulty with speaking English. He became a successful comedic actor, despite the language difficulties. He made the most of his wealth in California in real estate development. He became the governor of the largest state in the United States, the ninth largest economy in the world, as a Republican married into the most prominent Democratic family in the United States. He attributes his success to working harder and practicing more than others. Here's Arnold's total recall rules for success, the reasons he thinks he became successful. Number one, turn your liabilities into assets. Number two, when someone tells you no, you should hear yes. Number three, never follow the crowd, go where it's empty. And number four, no matter what you do in life, selling is part of it. But the part of the book that impressed me, he was about practice and repetition. I think about this for our residents and fellows who give a presentation, maybe their RSNA presentation. Sometimes I think it's practice only once or twice. But here's Schwarzenegger giving a speech to the United Nations in 2007. You can see all the tick marks at the top of the page on the right hand side. Each tick is a practice session. He practiced that speech 55 times. Clearly, Schwarzenegger is an outlier. His path is not for everyone. This book by David Epstein is about genetic differences leading to advantages in sports. Your genes or your key talents are unique and you need to take advantage of your capabilities. Still, I think then that when you're starting your career, a big issue that sets people apart is their dedication and work ethic. Regarding your mentor, there are a few things that can go wrong. For example, it's possible just to simply pick the wrong person. Your passion might be AI, say artificial intelligence. Your mentor, however, may not have success or experience in that new area. A second problem, unfortunately, it's not just a matter of picking out a mentor. That person also needs to pick you. They have to have the time and the personality to help you over the long run. If it's not working, try to develop a relationship with someone else. A final problem that can occur, I call it mentor averaging. This is the person who has four or five mentors averaging opinions of the various mentors. None of the mentors is really fully engaged or feels responsible to help that person. When you start your career, spending your time on a good idea, an interesting question is extremely important. And how do you come up with such a good idea? I think that's the hardest part. One of my biology professors in college had stated, most academics have one good idea during their career. I've been fortunate, I've had two. It takes time and experience in the field and help from your mentor on this critical point. Ideally, you want to spend most of your time on questions that matter. Choosing the right project is a talent. Here's an example. This might make a nice abstract at the RSNA. Role of MRI PET versus CT for detection and staging for follow-up of hepatic metastases from colorectal cancer. But likely, you will have a very hard time publishing that paper. It's been done. The question of comparison of two different imaging methods has little depth. Here are a few other projects that have more complexity and depth for comparison. For example, radiogenomic assessment of SNP variants in a certain disease in relationship to liver ADC values. Another example, one of my collaborators chose this topic and got a 10-year award from the NIH. Evaluation of the contribution of inflammation in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis is in psoriatic arthritis as a model disease. The idea was unique. Most researchers were only interested in anti-cholesterol drugs to reduce atherosclerosis. But the investigator realized that inflammation was also a key part of the vascular damage. A lot of depth to that question and a 10-year grant award. You can look at other ideas in the journal Radiology in the table of contents. 
do you see the type of project that you're doing in the Committee Bill of Contents itself? It can be very helpful to think of a checklist for new projects. Some factors to consider. Number one, are you studying a critical problem for patients? Number two, is it a big problem? Is it a large societal burden costing a lot of dollars for the healthcare system? Are there biological questions or just technical comparisons that you're doing? Is it a good, fundable patient population? Will you be able to improve the health of the population, the nation? Will you make people live longer with your research or invention? Here's another example of a good idea project performed primarily by a resident at Thomas Jefferson. This paper received the Margulis Award, the best paper of the year published in radiology in 2018. Now, with more routine artificial intelligence, this research would have less impact. But three years ago, it was very timely. Many people were just starting to use AI. And the topic was different. Most researchers were using AI to detect the lung nodules on a chest X-ray or CT. But a bigger worldwide problem, global health, was tuberculosis. In areas of the world with lots of tuberculosis have few radiologists and lack CT scanners. This work used AI to detect TB. And on the right side of the slide showed how the AI was thinking about chest X-rays in order to detect disease. Luck and a little opportunity also helps. Try to spend your time on singularly important problems. The Gates Foundation is a great example studying critical worldwide problems. The NIH studies topics of critical importance and imaging is nearly always a central part. Trendy problems are also good. Traumatic brain injury is an example. On the other hand, the big trendy problems often have problems of big competition. As an alternative, Part of your portfolio could be a rare disease. Part of my career was to develop MRI criteria to diagnose arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, but creating your own field is quite hard to do. To finish up, there are so many interesting topics in academic medicine and so many questions. The problem often becomes, make sure you ask a good question. Why? because a poor question that is not interesting takes almost as much work as a good question. When we receive papers at radiology for possible publication, we have two major scores. The first score, is the paper a good topic? Do people want to know about it? The second score, is the research well done? The problem arises, so much work can be done about a question that's simply not interesting to readers or reviewers. To conclude, for career building, it's very important to publish your ideas. This helps not just in academic medicine, but also in private practice and business. Factors that are important. Number one, good ideas are key. Both good and bad ideas take the same amount of time and money. Number two, collaborators are critically important. Try to have a lead mentor. Sure, that key mentor can change over time, but five mentors all at once is usually not successful. Number three, coattails. You succeed along with your collaborators, with leaders in the field. Team medicine, team research is critical. Try to work with other people who are successful in the field. Number four, hard work makes a difference. You're more likely to be noticed and be mentored if you're putting in the required time and effort. Finally, you do need to enjoy what you're doing. If you enjoy it all of that time, the late nights and hard work, it stops becoming work and instead becomes your hobby. You need to enjoy it. After all, there's going to be another 60 cases waiting for you to dictate. That's it for my advice. If you don't like my tips, there are many sources that you might like better. You need to seek those out. Thank you again for the invitation to participate in this Imaging Elevated Conference. This is David Blumke in Madison, Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Dr. Bloomkey. That was fantastic. So, um, as I mentioned before, just logistically, we uh, we have to consolidate questions into the Q and A feature on Zoom. So they're starting to pop up here for me. So I can pass those on, and hopefully, uh, you know, Dr. Bloomkey, this is kind of your time to shine, I guess. In addition to what you've already given us, uh, the first question I got here is I'm asking if you could comment a bit more on the decision to publish smaller, less impactful papers 
more frequently or should you try to consolidate into larger impact works? Um, it's often difficult, particularly for younger faculty members who have that incentive to publish earlier. Um, how would you recommend balancing that issue? Yes, hi, hi Matthew. Now I am live here. Obviously that was recorded sitting on top of Mesa Verde here. So I'm glad to be with everybody. And uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. I received uh, that question from an investigator this week by email, the same sort of topic. Uh, it was an early preclinical model. And uh, the question was, gee, you know, we, we know that radiology and other journals, they, they kind of want transla translational topics. Should we wait till we do our first in human subjects? And everybody's been in this situation and, and everybody needs to kind of document their progress. We can't always wait full, for the full thesis to be done, I suppose. So uh, my response in that case was, um, it, it may be that uh, it's time to write up the project. Um, when you translate to humans, perhaps there's another set of individuals who are involved, uh, another set of steps, um, a lot of extra time. And, and sometimes we just can't wait. The, there are people who are part of the project who need to be recognized. Uh, we need to document our progress in the interim. So there's a balance. Uh, I, I do think in, in that case, the authors were going to go ahead, for example, and uh, publish their preclinical results and uh, work <clears throat> simultaneously in the translation of their results in that case. But yeah, this is a, a constant topic. Um, uh, by the way, our, the editors of uh, all the journals have a, a special term for little, little bits of a project. Uh, it's called salami slicing. And uh, it's not the most... Uh, attractive term we you know from the point of view of the reader let's say we the reader and the editors and the reviewers want to see the whole topic uh, but uh, you know I'm also an author everybody who's on the editorial board is a frequent author and we know that uh, you know things are done realistically in parts and bits so there's a little bit of a balance there great thank you for um, somebody that's worried that they might be salami slicing or worried about that kind of uh, exposure to criticism, um, but they're still fairly fresh in the field and they don't have tons of experience under their belt, what type of person would you recommend reaching out to um, that maybe isn't part of the research group and doesn't have that interest uh, to get it published quickly, to, to get an answer to see if it truly is salami slicing? Yeah. You know, somehow the authors and my, my group and my folks in my, my experience is all, we never view it that way. We have unique uh, directions that, uh, you know, we, we think we have a result at the time. Uh, and uh, I think the authors, you know, you kind of really pretty know what the point is. So as long as, as, long as you develop that uh, study purpose, well-defined study purpose, uh, to try to develop a way to address that purpose uh, I, I don't think, especially junior folks, shouldn't be uh, that worried about it. Uh, you know, it, it may impact a little bit as far as the type of study, but uh, if it's not that study, it's going to be the next one, and you'll have another one to, to go on after that. Great. Thank you. All right, so some questions are pouring in. Sorry if I'm looking away from the camera. Um, Sorry, so I've been asked to mention who is asking these questions, if appropriate. That was from Allison Payne. Um, who is not a salami slicer, full disclosure. Uh, so the next one comes from Dr. Anzai. She mentions that she has found that many junior faculty or, or residents um, tend to get emotionally hurt when they get manuscripts rejected um, following submission, especially if it's to a, a well-known journal like radiology. Do you have suggestions for how to recover, I guess both emotionally and you know, professionally to move on to, to find a, a home for that journal or that article? Oh, oh yes, it's. I mean, it's a terribly depressing thing to get these uh, letters back from a reviewer comments that you you really think are not reflective of all that effort that you put put in, and it's it's really tough. You put yourself out on the line, and it's all there. You've put in a lot of time, and uh, then you know you don't have a good result. Um, I think the thing, one thing to think about is is a lot of submissions. It's, it's, it's like getting in medical school in a way, it's a statistical problem in some sense. Um, the rejection from a journal is in part a matter of what that journal is able to publish. So 
So take something like radiology. Um, the original research articles, uh, only a little bit less than one in 10, there's, there's like physical funding uh, to pay for the publication of that article. And, and the funding by that, I mean, uh, many journals, um, the society or the sponsor of the journal pays for. It costs about $5,000 to publish a manuscript, uh, let's say in radiology. And, and therefore there's a limited number. It's, there's a uh, definite number of papers that can be accepted. And so um, the reviewers are not perfect. Uh, the editorial board is not perfect. And uh, I, I published a lot, and therefore I probably had more rejection than anybody on this call. And uh, <laughs> the way that I look at it, uh, I've got a thick skin, first of all, number one. And number two is when I get comments that don't make any sense, I look at it a little bit differently now. I, I now sort of say, well, you know, I may not have explained this very well. It was so clear to us uh, that maybe partly I simply didn't explain it well. Now I know I have the reviewer's input. I'm going to use that and uh, hopefully benefit, make a, a better paper or a better revision than the next time. Great. Thank you. Um, so another one, this is from someone anonymous. So uh, I'll just go with it. Um, when submitting a paper for publication, do you think it is a good idea to swing for the fences for a higher impact journal? knowing that you'll most likely be rejected? Or would you recommend playing it safe, going for a lower impact journal? Um, sometimes it's difficult to have the time to submit to multiple journals. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, I've swung, again, as, as many as, uh, as anybody has. I, I do think that uh, there, there are a lot of factors that go into where you submit. I mean, obviously, you, you don't want to waste your time. You don't want to waste the journal's time. But no, I, I think it is reasonable to, uh, to swing for it. Um, it's not entirely clear all the time when you're in the middle of this research where your paper is uh, published in the spectrum of other things that are being received by the journal. Or um, really, your, your head is so much into your topic that you, you, you can lose perspective and uh, I think the goal is to uh, explain the topic, um, write a nice letter, cover letter to the editor and uh, position, try, help explain the topic to the editor and review board. And in addition, in your introduction, you know, try to make the topic compelling. Why I spent all this time on my summer vacation, you know, this is a, a really important topic. And, um, you know, I think that this, this uh, uh, research that we did is going to make a, a difference. So I don't, I don't have any problems with uh, going for high impact journals. If you don't submit to JAMA, you will never publish in JAMA. Um, certainly there's categories of research that work better in some journals than others. And, and that's kind of the difference. If, if you have a phantom MRI pulse sequence experiment, you know, radiology reviewers generally don't see so much of that. Something like MRM, mag, mag resonance in medicine would see more of that. So there's those categories, but certainly there's a lot of uh, manuscripts that straddle, you know, the, the general category. So, you no, know, I don't, I don't think it's a problem. Great. A follow-up question to that, um, to a specific thing you mentioned is contacting editors or co-editors directly. I think that's something that's really intimidating for junior investigators. How freely should we expect, you know, be willing to do that? Is it reasonable? Um, and then, uh, you know, how do you balance asking superficial questions versus really helpful stuff? Yeah, you know, uh, if you would have asked me in April and May a <laughs> question during the middle of COVID when we've received 1500 papers just on COVID, it would have been a problem. Uh, but, you know, I think most editors, if they can respond uh, time-wise, they do, you know, you know the the folks who are editors are authors, uh, teachers, mentors, and uh, you know it's something that we try to answer. On the other hand, you know there's a bit of a bias. Once I get into a paper, for example, and start advising on a direction of a paper, then I, I potentially have a conflict of interest. So uh, we want to avoid advising directions in your research, and. Um, so, you know, that limits the, the types of questions that we, we can answer. 
Um, the most frequent question I get is, should I submit the paper? <laughs> and uh, I usually say, yeah, I mean, I haven't studied the paper. How would I exactly know exactly based on a, an abstract or, you know, your, your um, explanation of the paper? We have to study it. And, and so I, those I, I usually cannot answer, you know, if that's a good topic for radiology. We get that a lot. Okay, thank you. Um, from Dr. Parker, who I think is asking this on behalf of the group, given his great track record. Um, can you elaborate on any rule of thumb for picking the right topic to work on? Is that a team decision? What advice do you have for that? Well, Dr. Parker is one of the, the most successful uh, right topic individuals that we have in our field. So um, yeah, and, and that is part of it. Uh, I think the challenge for junior, junior investigators um, really is connecting with uh, folks as to, or to spend their time. You know, this, there's introductory projects, you know, case reports and so forth. That, those are fine and those are really learning exper experiences. And then there's topics that you, you might think about okay, well, let's get some uh, RSNA funding for this project or internal funding. And there, you know, you really, it really helps to juggle these topics uh, with, with people in the field. And I'll give you an example. Uh, this morning, I was on a call with some of the most prominent medical physicists, uh, x-ray physicists in the world. And they had a new, new way to do x-ray imaging and uh, they, they wanted to compare the x-ray, the new type of x-ray to CT scanning. I said, boy, you know, it, it took us 25 years to, to get low dose CT scanning. Nobody's gonna wanna give that up and it's, it's the bar's too high. But if you've got a better x-ray, compare it to the old x-ray because those, those aren't so good. And, uh, and you know, if, if you are an expert in your technology or field, sometimes getting these opinions uh, maybe from outside of radiology, I think are, are critically important uh, because the panelists do look at the context of your imaging project relative to, to all of medicine. And so, you know, I think um, probably 90% of my collaborators are generally not in imaging, for example. They're in many different areas. Great. Thank you. Um, a similar anonymous question, kind of on similar lines. Um, what advice do you have for junior radiologists who realizes they are either assigned or chose the wrong mentor for them? And how do you break up with a mentor? That's a very good question. <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I think of how many people broke up with me and how they did it. They probably just disappeared. <laughs> I was wondering what happened to that project. But, uh, you know, certainly you're going to be uh, taking that project, the topic that you're interested in as a junior investigator, uh, perhaps you're going to be, let's say, not only working with people in imaging and radiology, but maybe you're going to be working with clinicians in other areas. And I do believe that you're going to navigate ultimately to find people who are, you know, as excited about your project as you and, and maybe see the big picture and things like that. So I think that happens kind of by itself. Um, this is a question from Dr. Minishima. Um, from your viewpoint, in what ways can a department support junior career development in addition to helping uh, assign mentors? Uh, yeah, uh, that that is uh, critical, and and I think uh, you know I think it's the in part at least it's the overall environment that you have. You know, this is a great example. This is this is not all that common to have, you know, nationwide seminar and. Uh, just kind of making it a part of what we do, I think is kind of the first step. And, and that's what we try to do in my own department. Um, these are um, kind of departmental cultural issues and uh, the ability to get involved in something and the openness of your staff to take the time uh, to help junior people is, uh, is really what I, I know one of the reasons why the staff is there in the first place. So uh, I think that's, that's uh, your, your own department is a great help. Um, we have a question from Dr. No, Frederick No. How do you how do you help people who struggle with their writing to the point of sometimes not seeing their problems? How do you get beyond those limitations? Yeah, I think most of us. Uh, I don't know if I can say all of us, but uh, if you think you're the best writer, 
you could give your paper to a scientific editor uh, and, and you'll see how much it can be approved and your communication can be um, really strengthened by working with people who are experts at communication and writing. So uh, I think we are all, we always get embarrassed a little bit to have people correcting these topics. And uh, I really do think that some of the most successful individuals I know had a, a strong editors or scientific editors or people who are just skilled at writing kind of help them rewrite and reformulate their questions. Yeah. Uh, we got a follow-up question from Dr. Parker. Also, what is your thought about multi-institution studies? Well, there's a, a couple of um, a couple of points. Uh, one is participation. Uh, uh, regarding participation in an ongoing study, if possible, I, I've personally found them to be extremely helpful. Um, the individuals uh, initiating those studies are usually the organizers and leaders, and uh, they've done half the work or sometimes 75% of the work. Um, and, and some examples, they're, they're the absolute best in the country or world. And then you're kind of hitching along with that uh, trial and, and learning the new techniques. And um, I had circumstances like that. I, I was working in breast imaging for a while, breast MRI. And uh, the question was, this is breast cancer. Gee, that's one of the most important topics in medicine. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing, but I've, I've, I'm enthusiastic. I've got an MRI scanner and a coil, and uh, maybe I can participate and learn and bootstrap my way into that field. Um, the other aspect of that is uh, multi-institutional trials versus um, doing your own studies. And this depends on the stage of research. Uh, some projects are certainly um, more amenable to uh, one or two or three trial sites, for example, because you can get patients more quickly. Um, it, it takes more organizational work. Uh, it's hard to do multi-institutional trials. And usually people are a little more um, advanced, get into those complications uh, with multi-institutional trials. Great. Uh, another anonymous attendee asks, how do you search for a new mentor for postdoctorate training when you want to try a new research direction, new research direction, uh, but you may have limited skills in that field? Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, and a lot of that is uh, luck and persistence. Um, I, I, there are research groups uh, who at times, they, they just need people who have a good track record, have good ideas, and who are enthusiastic. Uh, you may get a lot of no's or, or maybe not even answers at the time. Uh, but persistence, I think, is, is critical. And there's a lot of cold, cold calling that goes on. Uh, a lot of applications uh, in that regard like that, I think. Um, one of the first person I hired in a cardiac MRI lab had experience at high level in neurofunctional imaging and did a spectacular job and now is working for the NIH and so on. Uh, so it, you, hopefully you have an open-minded uh, uh, mentor or lab director, somebody to give, give an opportunity and you just have to keep trying, I think, in those circumstances. Great, so a bit of a follow-up question here. Um, even earlier than that scenario, people very early in radiology training that might uh, have some interest in academics, but find themselves incredibly overwhelmed by just the, the whole nature of research endeavors, um, in addition to clinical challenges when it comes to learning. Um, some people probably get scared off early off in that, that early stage. How do you recommend jumping in? Uh, I, if this would apply to perhaps a, a resident or someone in the and then the imaging sciences, but more on the radiology side, um, I, I would say hold off till you're comfortable because the first thing uh, that your, your training program is really about being a physician, being a radiologist. And um, recently we, we had a circumstance where we had a person at the fellowship level who really needed to get more comfortable with the clinical scenario and uh, spend dedicated time, get very comfortable with that aspect. Uh, if we would have the person do academic days and get distracted by research, uh, you, you become an expert of nothing. So, you know, at University of Utah, you expect people to be very comfortable with clinical questions and have a deep dive and, and get as much clinical experience as possible. But I would say that for everybody who walks in the door, it's, 
you know, this, it's almost certain that they will, they will see, eventually see enough, become comfortable enough that they have additional bandwidth to uh, actually make themselves comfortable because now in addition, they're clinical experts, they become comfortable at, at least at that clinical uh, aspect and clinical question. And they will have a lot of experience to, and how to, you know, they, they've observed patients with these diseases and how to address these diseases. So I, I think that's one relatively easier way for the clinical folks who uh, get, gather a lot of clinical experience and um, really know what's going on. They're comfortable in their own skin and around the department clinically. Great, thank you. I think we've gotten through the list of questions thus far. Any, any last minute questions out there? If not, I think we'll move on. So Dr. Minishima says, thank you so much for articulating academic radiology and career development so eloquently. Very, very appreciated. I'll second that. Thank you for your time and your expertise and sharing with us. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, the best part of my day, typically, these sorts of activities. Right. Well, um, so we're going to transition um, to our emerging investigator discussions. Um, Dr. Bloomquist, we'd be thrilled if you can join us for a Q&A after um, this handful of presentations. Um, so uh, uh, as I mentioned, we'll transition to these. Um, at the end of the symposium, I'll note that our six faculty judges will award a prize for the top emerging investigator award. Um, and again, just like with Dr. Bloomkey's section, uh, I'd, I'd invite you to type questions in, using the Q&A tool. We're gonna withhold the questions until all of our panelists have presented today, and then we'll have a combined session at the end to wrap up our, our afternoon. And so with that, we'll transition to our first Emerging Investigator presentation. This is from Shadi Esfahani, who is a fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital. So we'll turn it over to Dr. Esfahani. Um, spectroscopy for you. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm talking about the application of hyperpolarized MR um, spectroscopy for evaluation of treatment response in gastric cancer. As we all know, gastric cancer has very poor prognosis in advanced stages. Most of these tumors overexpress receptor tyrosine kinases, such as HER2 or 3 GFR, and that's why that RTK inhibitors are a part of the first line treatment in this type of tumor. However, patients um, develop resistance very quickly to these types of treatment, and the reason behind that is a baseline or population of another RTK in this family called HER3 that acts differently and um, uh, helps with uh, skipping the inhibition and the tumors basically grow back. And this is the reason that the new generation of RTK inhibitors are now in the market. Um, there are other FDA approved or in different phases of clinical trial. They are pan RTK inhibitors and they reversibly inhibit the uh, receptor tyrosine kinases. Um, so what clinicians need is basically to identify the patients who would benefit most from this combined RTK inhibition therapy. And for that, we obviously have CT and MRI, which give us a very uh, great informa anatomic information. We have FTG PET, uh, which is great for giving information about the tumor glucose uptake, but none of these imaging methods basically give any information about the early dynamic metabolic changes in the tumors to uh, predict uh, response to treatment. We think that hyperpolarism or uh, spectroscopy can be helpful in that manner and can give us information like in real time, in a real time, um, uh, to uh, evaluate the dynamic measurement of multiple metabolic processes in vivo. Uh, we all know that carbon is uh, uh, the um, backbone of many molecules in the body. Carbon thirteen is an atom that can that its signal can be identified by MR, and uh, we have very small amount of C thirteen in our body. So if we want to evaluate a, a molecule. Um, uh, in the body and evaluate its behavior, we can um, have the C13 atom on that molecule. And uh, basically what we need to do is that to enrich the, um, the amount of the C13 um, labeled carbon atoms. And then we use the dynamic nuclear polarization technique, which increases the number of spins that are aligned against the phenol. And that increases the C13 um, signal by more than 10,000 volts. How does it work? This is an example of a hypersense or a polarizer. And we basically 
um, add the vial of the molecule with C13. Uh, we add some free radicals to it, and we put the vial in a three to five Tesla uh, magnetic field with um, very low temperature of about one Kelvin. We use the microwave irradiation to uh, transfer the polarization from the free radicals to the C13 atoms, and then this frozen thing needs to be uh, thawed very quickly within a few seconds, injected within a few seconds, and then we can get the signal before it gets decayed within one to two minutes. And uh, how are we using it in the cancer models? There is a warmer effect in cancer that compared to the normal cells that they just uh, grab the um, glucose and uh, the uh, glycolysis pathway um, happens and the, uh, the cells get ATP through the TCA cycle. But in gastric cancer cells, um, like um, any of um, most of the, ga uh, the cancer cells, they basically use anaerobic glycolysis. And it means that instead of going into the TCA cycle, lactate dehydrogenase um, is overexpressed um, and uh, uh, converts pyro to lactate and lactate becomes the major source of energy for these tumors. So um, in our study, we are thinking that with inhibition of the receptor targets and kinases irreversibly with, for example, a drug of fatinib, then the pyruvate doesn't um, get uh, converted to lactate that much and it goes back into the TCA signal. And this is the way that we can evaluate the treatment response. So we are uh, evaluating to see if we can use MR spectroscopy for evaluation of these early changes in the glycolytic metabolism in gastric cancer. And we want to see if we can use it for prediction of response and if this method is more sensitive compared to FDG PET. So for in vitro studies, we um, evaluated a uh, panel of gastric cancer cells, and we treated the uh, cells with different doses of afatinib over time, and we chose a one resistant and one sensitive cell line, and we confirmed it with cell count under microscopy, and also uh, with the Western blood analysis with the downstream pathway nodes to make sure that we have uh, good cell lines for, uh, as resistant and as uh, sensitive cells, and also uh, optimal dose that can differentiate their behavior. Then uh, we also um, uh, evaluated the glycolytic enzymes and these two, um, uh, two cell lines. Uh, we you, uh, we um, uh, did Western blood analysis over uh, time and we saw that the LDHA activity level goes down the sensitive cell line. Uh, however, this uh, uh, LDHA level doesn't change in the uh, resistant cells and also the uh, level of uh, glute transporter and also the um, other enzymes do not significantly change in these two types of cells. Again, this is in uh, immunofluorescence assay that uh, um, uh, microscopy that shows the decreased level of LDHA in the sensitive compared to the resistant cells. Then we use the sensitive NCI and 87 cells and we injected them into the subcutaneous space of these mice. And we imaged on these mice before and four days after treatment with either a fatnib or uh, with vehicle to see uh, the difference um, at the baseline on day four. So FDG PET did not show any significant difference in the glucose up, uh, in the FDG uptake um, in these tumors at the baseline and uh, day four of treatment with afatinib. But with MR uh, spectroscopic imaging, we could actually see a very nice um, difference between these two groups. Um, in control group, the lactate to pyruvate ratio was not significantly changed between the two timelines. And in afatinib uh, treated group, we could see um, the significant drop in the lactate signal and lactate to pyruvate ratio. Also, uh, we uh, confirmed the, the treatment response with histology and also uh, with the tumor size evaluation over time. So we could see that MR spectroscopy is a more representative biomarker of early metabolic changes in gastric cancer. Uh, it's more sensitive compared to FDG PET. This method is uh, um, translatable and it can be used for other types of tumors as well. And we can use MR spectroscopic imaging for other metabolic mar evaluation of other metabolic markers that can be important in clinical management of patients. Thank you all very much. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Espahani. Uh, I'm glad that we still have some great uh, presence here. We've got over 80 attendees uh, this afternoon, so I'm glad uh, we have such good attendance here to see these great talks. Uh, so we'll move on to our next junior investigator, uh, who will be Jessica Santana, who is a graduate student at Yale University.
Hi, I'm Jessica Santana at the Yale Interventional Oncology Lab, and today I'll be presenting my work titled Non-Invasive Molecular Imaging Allows Characterization of Immune Response Following Hepatic Ripper Frequency Ablation in a Mouse Model. We have nothing to disclose. So giving you a brief overview on hepatocellular carcinoma, as we know, this is a classical inflammation-associated carcinoma, and now is the third most common cause of cancer-related death worldwide with the majority of patients being treated with local regional therapy as the main alternative option over surgery. However, local regional therapy demonstrates um, the recurrence in a significant fraction of patients, and the cost for recurrence can vary a lot. It has been suggested, for example, that the immune response to radiofrequency ablation plays a role in both off-target tumorigenic side effects as well as abscopal effects that in turn, in turn can positively impact the immune response to cancer. However, there is currently no instrument allowing for non-invasive monitoring of such immune response. Therefore, the purpose of this study is to develop non-invasive molecular imaging instruments to visualize the immune response to thermal injury following RFA. So our group has built a translational mouse model of radiofrequency ablation as a platform to develop and validate on MR-based immunoprobes for in vivo imaging of the immune response. Based on our findings, we have observed that following RFA in a normal liver, there is a strong time-dependent local infiltration of the immune cell population that orchestrates the tissue healing process. So having a specific cell population locally present at the transitional zone between the necrotic area and the normal tissue at a specific time point serves us as an in vivo platform to build and validate our dedicated immune probes. So guiding you through our experimental design, we have ablated a normal liver of a mouse and after inducing a local inflammation and characterizing a large infiltration of a specific cell population at a specific time point, we have established dedicated gadolinium labeled antibody that was systemically delivered in vivo to target a specific cell population observed at the chosen time point following RFA. And as a second established immunoprobe use in this study, we used a small iron oxide particles or spions. Iron particles has been largely used uh, in the clinic as a dark contrast agent. Once delivered systemically, they are able to be phagocytosed by circulating phagocytes that once they migrate to the site of inflammation, they lead to a local deposition of iron that can be detected through MRI. So in this study, both uh, gadolinium labeled antibodies and spines were able to be detected um, using a higher uh, MRI scanner, which is a 9.4 Tesla Burker. So, to the best of our knowledge, we know that RFA-induced thermal tissue injury largely contributes to a strong time-dependent innate immune response at the margins of the necrotic zone. And as our data shows, we have observed a time-dependent time -dependent accumulation of CD68 macrophages in the transition zone, especially one week following RFA in a normal liver. So, having that in mind, we have systemically delivered spines exactly one week post following uh, ablation, which is the time point that we observed the largest infiltration of phagocytes and CD68 macrophages. And as we could demonstrate in vivo, ex vivo, sorry, <clears throat> we have a local accumulation of the iron oxide particles at the transitional zone between the necrotic area and the normal liver parenchyma. And when we imaged those animals, we could see an in vivo uh, local deposition the position of phagocytes at the transitional zone following RFA. So here on your left, we have a T2-weighted MR sequence of one week post ablation 24 hours after systemic delivery of spines. And as a red path correlation, we confirmed ex vivo specific deposition of spines at the transitional zone through immunofluorescence and ex vivo, um, ex vivo Prussian blue staining. And as for our gadolinium labeled immunoprobes, we used anti cd 68 antibodies tagged with gadolinium. So after ex vivo observing a massive infiltration of CD68 macrophages in the periablation zone, we delivered a gadolinium tagged CD68 systemically, and we were able to, a specific, to see a specific deposition of those cells in the periablation of REM. So on your left, you have the picture taken seconds after ablation. Then a T1-weighted MRI one week post 24 hours after systemic delivery of CD68 uh, tagged with gadolinium. So on your right, you have an ex vivo confirmation of what was seen on MRI. And to further confirm, we compared the baseline also with the T1-weighted MRI with pure gadolinium and as well a T1-weighted MRI 24 hours after injection of those gadolinium-labeled CD60 antibody. And as you can see, 
um, there is a specific rim of um, CD68 positive macrophages that can be visualized on a T1 weighted MRI sequence with our gadolinium labeled probes. We also confirmed ex vivo specific labeling of those immune cells using image mass cytometry. <clears throat> so on your left, you have a T1 weighted MRI one week post ablation, 24 hours after gadolinium labeled CD68, um, systemically delivered where you can see a rim of the local deposition of the infiltrating cells. And on your right, we have the ex vivo confirmation of the, with the imaging mass cytometry of local deposition of CD68 positive macrophages in the transitional zone. So the main conclusions of this study is that both the spines and gadolinium based molecular imaging allows for specific labeling of local immune infiltrate. And this is a translational study with proof of principle for the feasibility of MR imaging of macrophages on 9.4 Tesla MR scanners. And as well, that non invasive in vivo detection of the immune system can be achieved with dedicated immune probes. And as for future perspective and clinical application, this allows us to have a useful tool to enable in vivo study and characterization of the interplay between the tumor microenvironment and immune cell activity, as well gives us a platform to allow study of strategies for um, local modulation of the immune microenvironment towards immunopermissive phenotypes and serves as a theranostic immunotherapy. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present my work as well as the Yale Biomedical Imaging Society. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. That was wonderful. And so again, I would encourage people to uh, enter any questions they have into the Q&A function in Zoom. We'll gather questions for our Q&A session at the end. Our next presenter will be Olivia Sale, who is a graduate student at the University of Western Ontario. Hi, my name is Olivia Sale, and today I will be giving a talk called Combining Iron and Fluorine-Based MRI with Magnetic Particle Imaging to monitor the delivery of mesenchymal stem cells and the ensuing inflammation in vivo. Mesenchymal stem cells have shown promising results as a cellular therapy and have been used in many clinical trials with the goal of regenerating and restoring damaged tissues. However, cell preparation is highly variable and so are engraftment rates. Many of the fundamental questions related to the fate of these cells remain unanswered. So were there cells administered to the correct location? How many are present over time? And this is important because uh, cells must be present in sufficient numbers for therapeutic success. And lastly, is there an inflammatory response? If we can answer these questions in the days following stem cell administration, we could know whether patients might need a repeat dose or another intervention. And so our lab is working on cell tracking techniques where the stem cells are labeled with super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles. And these labeled cells are transplanted to animal models where they can be imaged over time. And so our first objective for this project was to label stem cells with ferromoxidil which is an already FDA approved iron oxide agent. And then to detect these labeled cells in MRI and magnetic particle imaging. One million of these labeled stem cells were administered to the muscle of 10 mice in an isograft model. So the images were acquired on a three Tesla human MRI with the surface coil. And these images here show the uh, lower limbs of the mice at two different time points. So the iron in a uniform magnetic field used for MRI creates a distortion. And so the region where labeled cells are present appears as a dark spot. Uh, but unfortunately, this is nonspecific because we know that other regions in MRI can also appear dark. A major benefit of this technique, though, is that it is very sensitive. Our lab was the first in the world to detect single cells using iron-based MRI. Um, but one other disadvantage is that we are unable to quantify the number of cells which are present 
but we can estimate the number of cells by measuring the volume of this dark region. So that's what we did in these 10 mice. And what we saw is that the uh, volume declined in all 10 mice over 12 days, which suggests that these stem cells are dying and being cleared from the transplant site. We also acquired magnetic particle imaging or MPI of these same mice. MPI is a very new imaging modality. There are only a few of these systems in the world. And MPI is unique because it directly detects the iron oxide nanoparticles. So these images I'm showing you are now positive contrast and they show the density and the distribution of labeled cells. So we do rely on other imaging modalities for anatomical reference. So the MRI here uh, can be referenced. Um, and in these white boxes in the images shows the MPI signal, which corresponds to the iron uh, label in stem cells. And we can see that there's no MPI signal coming from the mouse uh, limb on the contralateral side. So overall MPI, we can see has better specificity compared to MRI, but uh, there's still some background signal. And here is some MPI signal coming from the iron in the mouse feed, which is now in the digestive system. But another major advantage of MPI is the direct quantification. So we can directly measure the iron contents now, which is an indicator of the number of cells present. And so you can see that there's also quite a lot less signal uh, on day 12. And so MRI and MPI showed consistent results regarding the stem cells. We also know that local information is very important to determine engraftment outcomes. And so this leads us to objective two, which is about labeling infiltrating immune cells at the stem cell transplant sites using a perfluorocarbon agent. And then we can detect these cells with fluorine 19 MRI. This is how this works is the fluorine agent is administered intravenously and it is taken up by phagocytic immune cells at transplant sites or these fluorine uh, labels can be um, taken up by the immune cells in the periphery and then recruited to the transplant site. Using the same MRI system, we've also acquired fluorine MRI, and that's just done by using the fluorine resonance frequency. So then I've overlaid that image to the anatomical uh, proton MRI and colored the fluorine signal. So you can see that these images show the presence of labeled immune cells surrounding the transplant site. And the signal is directly related to the number of immune cells present. And we can see that between all these 10 mice, the signal is highly variable, but remain constant over 12 days. And so uh, the level of inflammation is quite different in all these mice, um, but that we saw no change over time. And so now I'd like to conclude by saying we've demonstrated uh, iron-based MRI, fluorine MRI, and MPI can be used together to monitor the fate of two cell populations in vivo. We are the only site in North America to have both MPI and fluorine cell tracking capabilities. And these techniques right now are quite uncommon, but they're being increasingly used for this type of work. And so we're hoping that we can use these imaging techniques to uh, confirm appropriate stem cell delivery, monitor stem cell engraftment, and also to detect and quantify the uh, inflammation at transplant sites. And overall, this can help us to predict the outcome of stem cell therapies. I'd like to now thank the University of Utah for this opportunity to speak to you today. I'd like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Paula Foster, and co-authors on this work, Dr. Ashley Makala and Dr. Amanda Hamilton, and thanks to you for attending today. Thank you so much, Olivia. That was fantastic. Really provocative work that's drawing on many uh, cutting edge areas in imaging research. Um, so next we'll move on to Nan Wong, who is a graduate student at Cedars Sinai uh, Health System in Los Angeles. Dr. Wong.
Hello everyone, this is Nan from USLA and Sita Sana Medical Center in Dr. Gabelli's group. In my PhD, I'm mainly focused on the developing and accelerating quantitative MRI techniques. Uh, most of my work is uh, using multitasking framework, which is a novel and a flexible framework for high dimensional MRI. Today, it's a great honor for me to share some of our, our work using QMatch, a uh, multitasking technique for the evaluation of clotted atherosclerosis. Clotted atherosclerosis is a major cause of stroke, which is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Recent years, people have found that the vulnerable plaque has higher risk to cause that rupture and consequent clinical events. And the plaque composition is one of the major characteristics. multi contrast MRI is a very popular approach in the characterization of plaque compositions. However, most of the existing techniques are qualitative. Also, multiple scans are usually required to evaluate different compositions, which can cause misrepresentation. To overcome all the above mentioned limitations, we propose the QMatch, a five dimensional quantitative technique. It has three spatial dimensions to cover the entire clotted with sufficient spatial resolution at 0.7 millimeter isotopic. It has two temporal dimensions, inversion recovery dimension and T2 plus dimension to achieve a multiple T1, T2 weightings and T1, T2 mappings. This is a multi-contrast, multi-parametric technique for a comprehensive evaluation of clotted atherosclerosis. The sequence is a, a prototype flash readouts following periodic T2L preparations with different T2 prep durations. The different T2 prep durations generate different T2 weightings for T2 mapping, and the inversion recovery generates different TIs for T1 mapping. The no point of blood generate dark blood images for the over delineation, and the no point of the over generates MRA for the evaluation of vasculature. A randomized Cartesian uh, sampling pattern were used for incoherent data acquisition. The center case baseline was acquired every eight results to from the training data, and the rest of the imaging lines from the imaging data to determine the spatial features. In the reconstruction, the five-dimensional images were first formed as a survey tensor by combining the spatial dimensions in T1. Then, uh, instead of uh, recovering the images at different uh, time points one by one, multitasking framework handled the images as product of different factor matrices, spatial factor, inversion recovery factor, and uh, T2 plus factor. The total degrees of freedom of a factor matrix is much smaller than the original 5D images, and uh, therefore it requires a smaller amount of data and uh, um, shorter scan time. The final images contains a combination of every TS and every T2 plus. For the in vivo study, uh, all of them were performed on uh, Zhong An Hospital in Korea and a total of 39 patients with uh, ultrasound confirmed uh, clotted stenosis were recruited for the study. In the imaging session, besides QMatch, uh, TOF, pre-contrast T1, T2, TSE, CE, MRA, and CE, TSE were also acquired for the plaque localization and the identification. Since this patient cohort don't have the histology, so the conventional images were used for the plaque components identification, and uh, following that, the T1, T2 values from QMatch were evaluated for each combination. First, I'd like to display some patient cases. The first case is a patient with a lipid-rich necrotic core. The core has a hyper-enhancement on the CETSE with a ring-shaped hyper-enhanced hyper fibrotic cap. QMatch indicates it has a lower T1, T2 values consistent with literature. Second case is a patient with an intraplan hemorrhage the hemorrhage has a much higher signal on T1-weighted image and lower signal on T2-weighted images. Q-match indicates it has a lower T1, T2 values. The third case is a patient with a loose matrix and calcification. We can see the loose matrix has a higher T2 signal and higher T2 values on Q-match. The calcification has very low signal on all the contrasts and also on Q-match. The results are consistent between conventional and Q-match and literatures. This scatter plot displays the T1 and T2 for each plaque component identified in this patient cohort. Within the 39 patients, there's a 53 
plaques detected in total because the patient may have a plaque on both sides. 40, 45 other plaques has the lipid rich necrotic core. Uh, seven have a loose matrix. Uh, 23 have calcification and one have a um, intraplaque hemorrhage. And the T1, T2 value shows very good separation between different plaque compositions. This is the average T1, T2 values for each component agreed with the literature results. We also perform an ROC analysis and the AOC values indicate that um, uh, using T1, T2 alone or the combination of T1, T2 values to differentiate the, each component from uh, all others. Result shows that the combination of T1 and T2 has the highest AOC value for the differentiation of all the plant components. Indicates uh, the highest uh, accuracy. So at the conclusion, the T1 and T2 of different plant components are consistent with the published results. Also, the combination of T1 and T2 has the best identification of plaque, uh, of plaque components. In the future, we hope to evaluate lumen stenosis and plaque area using Q current QMAT data. Also, we uh, plan to perform this on large patient cohort with a histological validation. Also, we hope to test reproducibility across different systems. At the end, I would really like to say that um, quantitative MRI has been really hot topic recently. I do think that for all the techniques uh, to validate its number, to test its reproducibility, and to set a threshold for a clinical diagnosis is very important to really make all these advanced techniques into powerful clinical tools. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nan. That was fantastic. Uh, I think I can speak for my vessel wall collaborators that will, uh, that was very intriguing for us and we'll want to ask some more questions in the follow-up session. Uh, similarly, uh, I expect uh, some other intriguing work from our next presenter, Dr. Lee Chen, uh, who is a graduate student at the University of Washington. Hello everyone, I'm Li Chen from University of Washington. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I'm interested in using image processing and artificial intelligence tools to help medical research. Today, I'm going to share with you our recent progress of using an artificial intelligence tool, which we call ProPay, on popliteal vessel images analysis from a large data set. Atherosclerosis is a common vascular disease that cholesterol plaques are built up in the wall of the arteries causing obstruction of blood flow. Our circulatory system delivers blood to all anatomical regions, so atherosclerosis is known as a systemic disease. In previous research on vessel wall, people are focusing on carotid and intracranial arteries, which are more related with cardiovascular disease, but recently, we found the popliteal arteries visible from the MRI scan of the osteoarthritis initiative data set very interesting. OAI is a large study designed for osteoarthritis research with almost 5,000 subjects scanned for up to 8 time points for the knee. The good news is the OAI data set is publicly available. For people doing atherosclerosis and vascular research like our group, acquiring a data set of similar size is never feasible. We are excited to find that the OAI is a hidden treasure for vascular research. From the 3D death sequence of the mRNA scan from OAI, the vascular boundaries are clearly visible due to ideal blood flow suppression, high resolution, and large coverage. So vascular features such as vascular sickness are quantifiable for cardiovascular research. In addition, complete clinical data was collected in OAI. Traditionally, experienced vessel wall reviewers need to show vessel wall contours manually to acquire quantitative vessel wall features to analyze the images. However, this approach would take 67 years to finish the review for all 3.5 million images in OAI, but this is what AI can make the work possible. 
we expect an AI solution to automatically locate every region in the 3D image space, then segment and quantify by solver features with high accuracy and short time. Meanwhile, not many annotations are required to train a robust model. We develop fully automated and robust analysis technique for populated artwork vessel evaluation, which we call for pay, to analyze the whole OAI dataset. We identify artery center lines with a novel artery detection and track refinement approach, and then segment vessel contours along the center line for quantitative measurement of vessel features, such as mean wall thickness and lumen area. No human interventions are needed in for pay, so we can bring down the processing time from four hours to less than eight minutes. With parallel processing, we analyze all the OAI images within two months. To solve the challenge for other localization, we borrow the object tracking idea from Computer Vision Society. By considering the axial direction as the time axis of videos, popular artery can be robustly localized through the tracking by detection approach. For accurate vessel segmentation, images are converted in a polar coordinate system for segmentation to ensure boundary continuity and avoid impact from the neighboring artery. To minimize human annotations, transfer learning approach is used to train the segmentation model from a pre-trained carotid model. In addition, badly segmented samples are picked out for annotations for additional training to further improve the segmentation performance. Here are some examples showing the robust and accurate vessel segmentation on some challenging cases, such as bifurcation and large clubs. Some artery and vein may coexist, but for pay can select the correct target for segmentation. With for pay, there are many potential contributions can be made to the medical society. From the clinical perspective, for pay can be applied to knee scans to provide free vascular measurements on top of knee diagnosis reports. When plaques are observed, patients can be directed to have a more comprehensive vascular MRI scan on carotid or intracranial arteries. For research purpose, Propay achieves the workflow equivalent of 67 years of vascular bureau by exploring tons of vascular features with existing clinical features in OEI, such as cardiovascular risk factors, physical exercises, and state of diabetes. Vascular features can enhance our understanding on atherosclerosis and vascular disease. OEI and Propay facilitate many interesting studies, which are usually limited by data science such as characterizing vessel remodeling pattern for public arteries. Through hundreds of thousands of vessel measurements, we find human size increases with enlarging vessel thickness until a turning point then reduces this size with overly thickening vessel wall. The deep learning model using for pay is not a black box. Through visualization of embedding features for the public images, we can identify plug patterns such as what shows here, normal and clocks are formed in two clusters. Here's a list of awards and publications related with this project. This project is not possible without the involvement of all the people with different backgrounds. We also would like to acknowledge the support from AHA and NVIDIA. I think three components are needed for impactful research in medical imaging ideas, data, and techniques. Usually, it's hard to find all three components for your project, but usually data is the main obstacle for our research due to the expenses of medical scans and data availability. From our research on OAI dataset, we find it is an easy solution to explore existing large datasets from another angle. Fortunately, with the help of artificial intelligence, Previously impossible tasks are being made possible. Supported by large and automatically analyzed data, we can explore many creative ideas for advancing our knowledge on medical research. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Lee. That was fantastic. I'm very jealous of your data set. Um, so we're going to transition here. Uh, that, that was the last of our invited uh, junior investigator presentations. So we're going to have another Q&A session with uh, all five of those presenters. 
uh, as well as Dr. Bloomkey, who will join me for this session. So um, again, I would encourage you to type questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. You can see that Q&A tab at the bottom uh, of the control panel within Zoom. Um, and I'm gonna do my best to try to uh, consolidate these questions. Um, I've got a few here uh, for Dr. Uh, for, for Nan Wong um, from Cedar sinai and UCLA. Um, this is from Ed Devella, who says, very nice talk. Um, how long does the reconstruction Q match take? And do you have any concerns with motion and pulsatility? Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, for the reconstruction of QMatch, uh, for now we still have to do the offline recount. We copy the raw data from the scanner and the offline recount takes about uh, within one or two hours. So depending on the compute, uh, like the computer power. And um, uh, yeah, motion actually is a, like a big problem uh, during the uh, scan because the, the entire scan is about eight minutes. Actually, we do have some uh, motion uh, correction methods incorporated into this framework. So that's based on the uh, multitasking framework. So we detect the like the bulk motion, remove them, and then interpret it back in the multitasking framework. And uh, that can highly improve the image quality. Yeah. Great. Um, so another question while I've got you uh, on the camera um, from Dr. Parker, were you surprised that in 39 patients with 53 plaques, only one had intraplaque hemorrhage? That seems low based on our experience. Yeah, that, that's true. So I guess that's kind of based on this uh, patient, the truth of this patient cohort. So uh, we performed this uh, patient uh, study in Korea. So perhaps based on the, like the, for example, different races and because um, uh, this is uh, just a pilot study. So like maybe patient with uh, some, uh, like maybe just mild level of uh, stenosis would be included in the study. So I think that's why there's only one intraplan hemorrhage in this patient cohort. Do you have any more details on that cohort? Were they symptomatic and were there any uh, stenosis inclusion or exclusion criteria? So the inclusion is just based on the like the ultrasound. If there's a stenosis on the ultrasound, the patient will be included in the study. And okay. um, this patient should be uh, like a, with, with the symptoms, but um, maybe not very like not, like not very serious symptoms. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, so uh, we'll stick with vessel imaging. I have a question for uh, Li Chen. Um, what sequences are included in the OAI uh, data set? And then you mentioned having full clinical data. Um, can you expand on that a little bit more specifically with respect to cardiovascular risk factors and maybe cardiovascular events uh, outcomes data? Any of that available? Yeah, okay, thank you for the question. Uh, so actually, uh, the OEI study is not previously designed for osteoarthritis, uh, for osteoarthritis uh, work. So we just find this data set which is suitable for our work. So uh, there are uh, multiple MR scans available in the data set. But after our examining, we find the DES, the double echo steady state sequence, which is best suitable for our vessel world research because of the uh, reasons I presented in the presentations. Uh, so finally, we use only the death sequence for all our uh, data. And uh, for the clinical data set, uh, for the clinical data, I think uh, the original purpose is not for cardiovascular uh, disease, but to share many of the common things that we can use. For example, uh, how many people are finally uh, dead and uh, uh, like some, uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, by correlating the vessel wall information with this clinical information, it can help us a lot to further our understanding of how these uh, factors are correlated with each other and enhance our understanding for the atherosclerosis. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, another uh, follow-up question uh, for you. Um, how much pre-processing of images do you need to do before applying AI uh, to vessel tracking? So actually our method is called fully automated. So that means nothing needs to be prepared. Everything is handled by this for pay model. Uh, so uh, in that image processing part, I think the only thing we need to do is to rescale the image intensity into a common range and all the others are handled by AI. Wow, great, thank you. Um, 
try to consolidate by presenter as best I can. Um, a question for Olivia uh, from Sarah Johnson. She said, great talk regarding, uh, regarding the void volume decreasing over time. How is it confirmed that the mesenchymal stem cells were being cleared from the injection site rather than just the SPIO agent? And is cell death required to clear that agent? Thanks for the question, Sarah. Can you hear me, hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here today. So thanks again to Utah. Um, to answer your question, there is really no evidence for the iron being expelled from cells. So really whatever happens to the iron uh, within the labeled stem cells uh, reflects what's happening to the cells. So uh, the predominant mechanism that's happening is these stem cells are dying off and in that process they release their iron. So in that way then the uh, nearby immune cells will take up this cellular debris including the iron and clear it from the site. So I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. Um, question I had also for you was, what is the biological half-life for the SPIOs in those stem cells? Um, typically, these tend to lose contrast over time, and the labeling approach to track them in vivo um, can be limited in some settings. Right. So um, it's a little bit different to think about the half-life of the iron in cells versus just the half-life of the iron itself if you were to inject it intravenously. So those are two different questions, but in the cell, uh, for the most part, as I just mentioned, it's retained within the stem cells. And what could be happening in some situations is that uh, with rapidly dividing cells, that iron becomes diluted uh, between the cell progeny. And so really what that, would, um, what that would cause in our images is that we would be underestimating the number of cells. But uh, for our situation here, we really made no effort to make these cells survive. Most of them die off anyways. So what we're, we're not really expecting much proliferation. And so this type of cell tracking technology is really good for those types of cells. So cells that might be terminally differentiated, that they aren't really dividing much, uh, that kind of thing. Great. Um, another follow-up question to that is, do you have an idea of what volume or percentage of the cells need to survive to um, deliver their therapeutic effect? And um, I, I suspect that might be a hard question to answer with just one, you know, depending on your effect that you're looking for. Um, but have you considered using these techniques to try to help obtain those answers? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think there is no answer to that. We wouldn't know the answer to that. Um, it's going to also vary a lot between patients, what works for one person versus another. Uh, also, what kind of stem cells are administered in what situation. Um, so yeah, we can rely on these imaging well, techniques, not only in uh, clinical studies to monitor what's happening to these cells and inform treatment decisions, but also in preclinical studies, we can look at uh, optimizing these cell therapies uh, what works and what doesn't, what improves uh, the stem cell survival in animal models before um, applying these to humans too. Great. Um, I got several questions about MPI, the iron imaging. That's pretty hot. Uh, is this only a tool for preclinical imaging? Can it be applied to humans? Um, how many are out there? I think several of us have never heard of that before today. <laughs> Yeah, right. It is a very new imaging modality. Um, uh, there was, you know, some scanners made in different labs uh, made by grad students over the last decade or so. Now they're available commercially. And so there's a handful of them in North America. And we just got the first one in Canada in London, Ontario. So it is a very unique imaging modality in the fact that it directly detects a uh, the iron oxide agents and everything is still under development, including these nanoparticles, because right now we've just repurposed the nanoparticles from MRI to be used for MPI. So there's really a lot that can be improved on as well. In terms of human scanners, there are a couple groups that are working on various MPI um, systems to be used with humans, for example, a head scanner. Um, and eventually we're hoping that will be fully scaled up. Great, that's very impressive, thanks. thanks. Um, Dr. Bloomkey, I don't want to neglect you and your expertise. Uh, please feel free to chime in if you have any questions. Right. Could I follow up on with Olivia on that? 
that question. Um, has MPI led you to any insights so far as to where's the iron going? Uh, so, you know, the iron eventually kind of dissipates or decreases over time. And um, one, one question is, you know, what, is, what has happened to that as a different state or something? Any, any insights so far with MPI and what, what's happening to the iron? Yeah, uh, we're learning so much with this new technology, mostly because of uh, the iron oxides creating a void in MRI. Uh, so for example, imaging in the lung, uh, in the bone, things like that has been very difficult. And so with MPI, we can start to do things like that. Um, so it's been fun. And uh, our lab actually just put out a preprint on our perspective on MPI for cell tracking. So you can look for that too for more. I had a, a question for um, uh, Shadi about her work on gastric cancer. And, uh, you know, the response uh, using the hyperpolarized uh, equipment is uh, incredible and, and very, very rapid. Um, if you, could you kind of explain to us how this could, uh, how that could translate? Is this something that would be used perhaps very early in therapy to see if this person could avoid the uh, two months of not successful therapy, or um, are, are we at that point yet where um, you know we're we're really trying to determine certain tumor types, perhaps using this sort of technique, or where does where do you see that going? Um, hi, Dr. Blumke. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, as you mentioned, the uh, MRI spectroscopy imaging is uh, evolving very, very rapidly, um, and as you know, there are about thirty to forty centers in the whole world that are using the MR spectroscopic imaging. Some of the centers also have the human polarizer. We um, just received our uh, preclinical polarizer and we'll have the uh, human polarizer very soon. So um, in terms of um, how it's going to uh, work, uh, it looks like based on the literature so far, there's so much work still ongoing in the preclinical setting. Um, and um, a variety of tumors have been already evaluated um, in addition to other conditions such as inflammation or uh, you know myocardial perfusion imaging um, this method has been tested on many types of tumors so far uh, and also different types of metabolites uh, have been evaluated for evaluation of early response uh, and there has been really really great um, um, amount of articles um, in the past two years about the early treatment response. And this would be really, really tremendous. It would be very helpful to the clinicians if we can, if we can um, basically translate it and have uh, this method in addition to an, uh, a, a standard of care um, MRI or PET-MR to uh, basically have that as an addition to our anatomic imaging to help the clinicians with uh, early the uh, evaluation of response. I think um, the future is really bright in terms of how fast we can have it um, nationwide and worldwide and use it in our clinical practice. I think we are still learning so much about it, but it's been, the knowledge has been very um, uh, growing and it's been it's been very fast. So I'm really hoping that um, in the next few years we can have um, a lot of great data that we can basically translate it in uh, in our clinical practice. So one little little follow up uh, on that. Do you have any any insight as to how the technique scales to larger animal models um, and the SNR as the um, size of the patient or size of the animal gets larger? Is the, is the scaling factor going to work for this technology? Um, um, I think so. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not the best physicist to answer this very well, uh, but uh, yes, I'm very hopeful because uh, the, uh, the amount of work on, um, like in the scale of mouse, uh, rat, uh, um, and also human has been really great. The coils are obviously very important. Um, and uh, um, I know that there are a lot of companies right now that are tremendously working on this. Uh, so I'm really hoping that the SNR wouldn't be uh, a huge issue. There are specific codes right now for a lot of um, brain imaging, abdominal, upper abdominal imaging, and prostate imaging. Um, so um, as the time goes, uh, we need a lot of um, technology to help us to make sure that we get great SNR. 
Great, great. Matt, can I go ahead with one, one more to Jessica? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jessica, the, uh, the progress in the field does seem to be moving towards uh, not only an issue of killing the tumor, but the stimulation of immune response. And uh, you uh, showed really elegant, elegant ways to show uh, that immune response. And the examples you've shown, it, it was this uniform line or band. Uh, I'm wondering if you are, how you're going to look at uh, differences in early tumor recurrence, uh, juxtaposed perhaps next to the tumor response. Are you going to do imaging of both the tumor and the immune response? or? Uh, how are you going to try and tease out uh, what causes the recurrence or maybe success or versus failures of the immune response or lack thereof versus the tumor aggressiveness? Um, hi, thanks uh, for the opportunity again to present my work here. So that was a good question. So for this uh, first work, uh, firstly, we tried to establish those immunoprobes, especially the uh, one with the uh, gadolinium labeled antibodies in a reproducible way. So the next step right now is, is to use the same set of techniques to label the antibodies that will target T cells. So that's like our main and the next uh, goal is to be able to image uh, T cells in an inflammatory um, tumor microenvironment. And uh, once we achieve that step, the way we're gonna see like if there are gonna be a response or not, um, that would be like the immune profile that we could be imaged prior to treatment. So let's say if um, a tumor is uh, considered immunogenic, meaning there's a lot of uh, T cells um, present, there's a, a higher um, chance that that tumor in particular will respond better to immunotherapy, for example. So in this way, the main primary of this work is just to be able to identify um, those types of uh, tumors uh, and the immunophenotypic profile prior to treatment to um, sort of like um, map out or um, segregate, which is the tumor that's more likely to benefit from therapy than the one that's not. So I hope I kind of like answered your question. Yeah, it's, it's really one of the, the newer concepts, I think, in RFA, whereas, um, individuals, the, the, the interventionalists thought you just have to burn it and kill it. And mm -hmm. you see these uh, very interesting immune responses uh, developing in patients who are successfully treated or not. So this <clears throat> starts to get at that question, if you can um, go really beyond just imaging the tumor all the time, but the, the yeah. response to therapy. Yes. Uh, and how, what is the, uh, how does edema confound some of those analyses. I guess you, you really should, shouldn't be too affected by adjacent edema, I suppose, right? Well, yeah, there is the, the fact of um, what they call the pseudo progression, which is like if the, if the tumor um, itself, it's like it's responding or not. But in our case, it's like um, we're essentially trying to um, image in a, in a sophisticated way uh, those immune cells. So if we're able to locally detect and prove that there is a um, precise imaging of those uh, immuno immunocells, uh, we can sort of like distinguish between a sort of progression or, um, or the response of the tumor. Got it. Okay. I had another question for you, Jessica. Um, have you done any um, looks at parameters at the time of treatment specific to the ablation uh, and correlating that with the outcomes on the surveillance imaging to see if there are uh, certain variables that need to be controlled or modulated by the interventionalist to achieve the best outcome? Well, not yet, because this, um, as I said, the set of experiments is just to establish those immunoprobes. So we're not ablating tumors, we're ablating normal liver. Mm -hmm. okay. and. And the fact that we are ablating normal liver, it's because we have noticed that upon ablation of a normal liver, we induce a local uh, immune response towards it. So, and the immune response is essentially characterized by the healing uh, process. So, because you induce a local um, inflammatory um, process uh, following RFA. And we use that as a platform to image those macrophages and build 
uh, those immunoprobes in a reproducible way. So we're not like ablating tumors yet. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, I had a question in the Q&A for you that I didn't want to neglect from Allison Payne. Um, she's asking, is the ultimate goal really to have a marker that could identify treatment outcomes at the end of the therapy? Um, is one week follow-up considered standard for immunotherapies? Um, and is this something you could potentially use as a marker for whether or not you need to ablate more, perhaps sooner? Yeah, um, one of our techniques that right now we're trying to develop is we're trying to image the pH, um, local pH. So um, in our previous work published in the radiology paper in a VX2 rabbit model, we uh, were able to, well, we didn't use RFA essentially, but we used TACE. And we were able to show that upon taste, um, there is um, a changing in the pH. And we also co-localized those immune, uh, immune cells um, in the peritumoral area that were tagged with the HLA-DR gadolinium antibody. Um, so the set of this work in the future is to try to essentially um, image this immunometabolic crosstalk that might be um, reflective of uh, the tumor response post um, local regional therapy. So essentially we're trying to combine, let's say imaging the local pH with the immune response following um, let's say RFA or TACE and so on. But in mice right now, we're just focusing on RFA. Great. Um, Dr. Bloomkini, others, I, I think I've gotten through the, the questions that were written to me. Uh, yeah, no, those were beautiful presentations and uh, really good answers in addition to all around. So people know. I'll second that. <laughs> Definitely. So um, I think with that, we'll wrap up our first day of Imaging Elevated then. I want to thank everybody who participated. Um, I want to thank Dr. Bloomkey uh, for uh, participating today and also for your leadership in our field. And then also for our junior investigators. I think the future is quite bright for uh, for imaging research. So it's been a fun afternoon. Um, so don't miss tomorrow and Friday at the same time, 3 p.m. Mountain, uh, 3 to 5. We have more exciting content uh, to get the full details of our agenda. Uh, please visit imagingelevated.org. Um, and with that, I think we'll close out day one and look forward to seeing you guys all virtually tomorrow. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.